Good morning. Welcome to our webinar on lump sum funding in Horizon Europe. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ulrich Genschel. I'm a head of sector in the European Commission working on the simplification of processes for Horizon Europe. Uh, I'm here today with my colleague Andrea Kikosch and together we have the pleasure to guide you through this webinar. Uh, before we get started, let me quickly explain how this is organized. We have two hours uh, to explain lump sum funding and the first part will be a presentation uh, so everybody is uh, informed on the main principles uh, of how lump sum funding works from proposal submission to grant management and uh, controls. Then we are going to have a second part where we welcome three beneficiaries of ongoing lump sum grants. They are going to share their experience with us and they are also going to help uh, answer your questions in the third part. The third part will be, uh, as always in our webinars, a question and answer session where you can raise all your questions uh, that you may have after the presentation or that you have already. Uh, on details and you ask them through Slido. The details have been shared on the event page. Uh, I encourage you indeed to check if your question has already been asked and in that case uh, do upvote the existing question rather than asking the same question again. So here we start with a presentation already. Uh, as an introductory remark I should say uh, lump sum funding is using as much as possible and everywhere possible uh, the principles and processes that we have established in the traditional actual cost grants. So the changes are in fact limited to where we need to make changes. And this presentation and this webinar is going to focus on those changes. Where are we different and what is, uh, yeah, what works in a different way than in the grants that we've been running for many years so far under actual costs. Um, of course, uh, in half an hour, I cannot cover every last possible detail. So uh, you will also see where further information and guidance is available. And of course, uh, there is the Q&A session. So with that, I will start with the first slide. I'm trying to see if my, um, not yet. Here we go. <clears throat> so, the first question, of course, is why do we use lump sum funding in the first place? There are three main reasons in no particular order. Uh, we need them to reduce the financial error rate, which under actual cost is quite big and has been criticized by various institutions as, as uh, unacceptable and we need measures to reduce it. And there, lump sums and other simplified cost options, also unit costs, but lump sums in particular are a key measure to achieve this because the error that we expect with lump sums is very low or even zero. And then lump sums have a very significant potential for simplification because the main difference with actual cost is that there will be no actual cost reporting and no checks, no financial checks, I should say, on costs. Because once we have agreed the lump sum before we sign the grant agreement, this lump sum is not going to be questioned afterwards. And at the same time, we must recognize that the actual cost system will and is, you know, will remain and has always been rather complex because we need a lot of rules to make it work to uh, accommodate all the different accounting practices in Europe and beyond and that necessarily makes for a complex and error-prone system despite all the efforts we have made over the many years to make it simpler. So a big step in, in simplifying grants in our view is lump sums because we get rid of actual cost reporting, resources reporting and the corresponding checks. And then lastly, but not least, is the focus on content, which we believe can be much stronger uh, in general. And with lump sums, we get an incentive to look at the content because we have no reason to look anymore on the financial side of grants. We will therefore always look intensively at what's happening in the grant. Um, and that is indeed what the program is about. We are not uh, setting up, Horizon Europe is not about spending money in the first place, but is about uh, reaching objectives and the content, therefore, of the grants that we fund uh, 
that of course, and the funding is the means to achieve that. And we could, when we need a system that is as simple as possible to achieve that. Um, one other reason is that uh, actual costs are really difficult to use in our experience for newcomers and small organizations. On, on this graph here, you see that the vast, vast majority of the beneficiaries in the research and innovation program are small actors that have just one grant in the whole program. Um, so that's like two thirds of the unique beneficiaries of 42,000 unique beneficiaries we had in Horizon 2020, 26,000 just had one grant. And then on the other hand, on the other side of the distribution, you see a very small share of big organizations who have many grants. What we see in, in reality is that the organizations with a lot of experience that are bigger organizations and that participate often, they have a relatively low error rate and they know the system and they have the experience and also the administrative capacity to deal with actual costs. But the newcomers, the SMEs, the small organizations that just participate once in a seven year period do not have this. And it's probably expect a lot, expecting a lot to uh, think that they would master uh, the complexity of actual costs in one single time that they participate. So lump sums again offer the opportunity for them to participate without errors. Uh, and therefore, that would be a system that works for all our participants, which are very, very different in nature. So we, ex we, we tried to explain lump sum funding from the start when we tested it in 2018 or since 2018. And we are aware of some concerns that have been repeatedly mentioned. Uh, we are certainly aware of them, we are addressing them, but we see no blocking issues with them. So particular concerns that we've heard is that it's more work to set up a lump sum proposal compared with setting up an actual cost proposal. Also, there's the notion that there is less flexibility in the grant management of lump sum grants. And then also importantly, uh, people think, some people think that there's a higher financial risk uh, associated with lump sum grants, and that leads to fewer newcomers, fewer SMEs, and less ambitious proposals. Of course, these are serious concerns, but what we actually see and what we should be aware of uh, are the misunderstandings that are associated with these concerns. So, first of all, budget details as they are needed in a lump sum proposals, we are seeing this in a bit more detail soon, uh, are of course needed in any kind of proposal setup for any EU grant, not only for lump sum grants. The difference is, the difference is that in lump sum grants uh, and lump sum proposals, you need to share these details. You need to submit those details as part of the proposal. But the difference is not that you have to establish and have those details on file. That is the case for all EU proposals that you submit. And then uh, some people think that lump sum payments would only be paid, we would only make the payment if there's an actual successful outcome. That's probably the most fundamental misunderstanding about lump sums. No, that's not true. We pay when the activities have been carried out. In other words, when the work has been done as described in the grant agreement, completely irrespective and independent of whether there was a successful, a positive outcome or not. And then, if the work was only partially done, which can happen, we are not going to treat this as a black and white all or nothing case. No, uh, in that case, the partial work will be paid partially to the degree that the work was actually carried out. So it's not true that we will, in case somebody has a 95% completion of the work, it's not that they're not going to get anything. No, they're going to get 95%. And lastly, I would uh, highlight that uh, the idea that uh, beneficiaries have fewer obligations in actual cost grants is plain wrong. The, the number of obligations that you have in an actual cost grant is clearly higher and there is no obligation in a lump sum grant that you do not also have in an actual cost grant. So there's clearly more obligations and more eligibility conditions for payments in actual cost grants. And the reason is that we have agreed on those things up front in a lump sum grant. So we have agreed on the cost. And so all the conditions that are related to these costs are not, uh, are not applicable anymore. Once the grant is signed and during grant implementation, they are not relevant for lump sum grants, but they are of course relevant for actual cost grants. So I stop here and go to uh, 
the actual implementation of lump sums, we have two principal options. Lump sum option one, where the commission fixes upfront the lump sum in the call for proposal. We are using this quite rarely now. The only example in the current uh, work program is the ERC proof of concept call. That is a predefined amount of 150,000 euro. So if successful, any applicant would get exactly this amount and the applicants describe the work that they are going to carry out for this fixed amount. The vast majority of lump sum funding that we are using in Horizon Europe, however, is type two, where the applicants define the lump sum in the proposal. They provide the cost estimations, they provide a, pro a budget estimate, uh, and that will then after evaluation translate into the lump sum. So we define the lump sum individually for each grant. This is the closest uh, possible implementation to what you have in the traditional actual cost grant where also uh, applicants define the budget de based on their estimations of the costs. When you write a lump sum proposal, you will see that you use the same standard application form as in any other Horizon Europe application. So the principle that we use the standard processes uh, wherever possible starts here. We have the standard application form and you present the objectives and the methodology, uh, effectively the, la the largest part of your proposal in exactly the same way as in an actual cost grant, as in an actual cost proposal. So no differences here really. The big difference is that you have an additional document which uh, contains the detailed budget for your lump sum and which is necessary for us to define the lump sum and for you to justify it. This detailed budget table is an extra Excel file that you download from the online submission system. Make sure that you don't use any other versions <clears throat> that might be available anywhere else uh, or might be circulating anywhere else, do use the version that is part of the online submission system, completed and submitted as part of your application. Uh, now this, this detailed budget lump sum uh, breaks down all the cost categories that are possible. The cost categories are the same as in any Horizon grant and you resolve them per beneficiary and per work package. Uh, these cost estimations, they must be an approximation of your cost. The principle of lump sum funding is that we find a proxy with a lump sum for what your actual costs would be if we were using actual costs. So also the same eligibility criteria apply. Anything, any cost that is eligible in a traditional actual cost grant is equally eligible in a lump sum budget table. So you need, to, uh, you need to follow the same eligibility rules and you need to follow also, like in any other proposal, apply your normal practices and the costs that come out, they must be reasonable, non-excessive, and of course, they must be in line with what you propose and that must be sufficient and uh, appropriate to achieve and carry out the activities that you are planning. Well, and then based on these detailed cost estimations, this uh, budget table, this Excel sheet will automatically generate a breakdown of lump sum shares, one share for each work package and per participant. So this breakdown shows uh, the amount, the lump sum share that each beneficiary would get for each work package. We are going to see this again in more detail later in the presentation. Uh, and for the details on how to fill in this lump sum, budget table, I refer you to the funding and tenders portal and also very importantly to the instructions that are part of that Excel sheet. So the very first sheet of that uh, Excel tool is a detailed instruction on how to use it and how to complete it. Uh, another important thing to watch out for when you design your lump sum proposal are the work packages. Now in principle, as said before, uh, work package, the work plan, objectives, methodology, all of that works in principle exactly in the same way as in an actual cost grant, and this is true, but you have one additional possibility in lump sum grants, and that is you may split work packages if you deem necessary. The aim of that is to optimize the cash flow because I could already mention here, you will be paid in a lump sum grant for the work packages that you have completed. So a work package that lasts for the entire duration of the grant can only be paid at the end of that grant. A work package that is finished at the end of reporting period one 
can be paid at the end of reporting period one, provided it's completed by then. So uh, you may split work packages, but you need to watch out that uh, the result of splitting work packages does not lead to a uh, unworkable or inefficient work plan. So we instruct our experts to uh, allow for splitting work packages in lump sum grants, but at the same time, they must also make sure that the resulting work plan is still efficient and functional, such that you do not have a, a large multitude of minuscule work packages. So that uh, you need to bear in mind. I show you one example uh, uh, of what the splitting could look like. Uh, in the upper case, you see a four-year project divided into three reporting periods and a single work package. And this is a classic example, the work package for project management. Very often, this work package for project management lasts for the entire duration of the project. And in this case, um, it will only be paid in a lump sum grant at the end of the grant after four years. Now, if you consider it necessary that you are paid for the management work that you do before the end of the grant, you are, you are perfectly allowed, it's perfectly possible to split that work package, for example, in as many reporting periods as there are. So in this case, you see in the lower panel, uh, the result after splitting this single work package into three separate work packages, management one, two, and three, one for each reporting period. And in this way, the management work can be paid at the end of each reporting period. Uh, again, I would stress this is only necessary and recommended if you need it to optimize the cash flow by content. The content doesn't change that way. It's, it's really only to allow you to be paid for work earlier. And for example, in cases where you have a large pre-financing in the project, we have many projects, for example, that get 80% pre-financing. Uh, there's perhaps no need to optimize cash flow. And in that case, I would really carefully consider if you really use that option. But that's an option that you have in lump sum grants, in lump sum proposals. So next step after you've submitted your proposal would be the evaluation. Again, most of that works in the standard way. We apply the standard evaluation criteria, excellence, impact, and implementation. And all of that works in exactly the same way as always. The difference is now that we are going to assess your cost estimations, your detailed cost estimations that you submitted in the Excel table against the activities. And this will be taking place under the implementation criterion. So the experts are briefed to make sure that the cost estimations are reasonable and not excessive. And they need to make sure that your cost estimations and the split between work packages and the split between partners is reasonable and allows you to actually do the project, to carry out the project as described. The experts now also have the possibility to correct the budget if they find that certain costs are overestimated. Effectively, what we are checking here already in the uh, proposal evaluation stage is that the costs are necessary and reasonable. Um, this, of course, can, in some cases, lead to corrections. Uh, we are basing those on the recommendations of the experts, which you will also find back in the evaluation summary report. And if such recommendations are made, uh, and you find this in the ESR, we will take this into account and correct the lump sum amount that you will then get in the grant agreement. I should stress that if corrections are necessary of the budget, this is not going to penalize the project and is not going to decrease its chance of being selected for funding. Uh, a few corrections like that could be perfectly accepted and we will just uh, make uh, a small adjustment to the lump sum, but otherwise the chance of uh, the project to be funded is not affected at all. The only exception, of course, is if the budget is really flawed, if, there are <clears throat> if the budget is completely inadequate or really very far from acceptable, that could then, in that, in that case, you could very well have a decreased score. In that case, of course, would also affect negatively your chance of being selected for funding. Maybe I could already mention here that the vast majority, or well, the big majority of projects, in fact, of proposals <clears throat> that we select for funding with lump sums do not have a budget cut. But uh, 
a, a minority, of course, has. And this indeed shows to us that the system is working. Uh, many projects go through without having any cuts and because they made reasonable and acceptable uh, proposals for the lump sum costs. And a few do indeed get corrections, but even in those cases, it is very rare to see large cuts. What experts also use is a, uh, a benchmark, the dashboard for lump sum evaluations that is publicly accessible, but uh, it is targeted and is uh, meant to be used by experts who carry out the lump sum evaluations. What they can see is the average personnel cost in Horizon Europe per country and per organization type. So the example that you see here in the upper panel is a distribution of average personnel costs in re Romanian research organizations. And on the lower panel, you see the same distribution for German research organizations. Now we have, as a matter of fact, uh, in the EU and beyond uh, very big differences what concerns personnel costs in the different countries. So this benchmark makes sure that the evaluators have a guideline to check what is a reasonable personnel cost. Uh, because indeed the situation varies dramatically or drastically between different countries and also between different organization types. So uh, the idea here is that if you ask for personnel costs that are above what we consider a normal corridor. In fact, statistically speaking, this is showing the distribution between the 20th and the 80th percentile, meaning that 20% of our grants have personnel costs that are actually lower than this distribution and 20% have personnel costs that are higher than shown in this distribution for each country and for each organization type. So if you are within this distribution, probably the experts will rarely uh, criticize this because that is considered to be the normal corridor. If you are above this uh, average, sorry, if you're above this 80th percentile, in other words, if your personnel costs belong to the 20% most expensive uh, in your country, in your organization type, then we expect that you really provide a justification for those costs. And this is also what the experts will be checking. So it is, of course, absolutely acceptable. And there is no to have higher costs. There is no automatism to cut those higher costs. But be aware that you need to explain why, you, why your costs are uh, among those 20% highest in your category, meaning your country and your uh, type of organization. And if you provide this justification, there is no reason to expect that those costs should be cut or should be criticized. When we come to grant preparation, again, uh, the message is we use the standard process. We have in particular the no negotiation principle uh, applying to lump sum grants as to any other grants. This means that normally the project is funded as it was uh, submitted, as it was proposed. However, there are some changes possible. First of all, of course, uh, we can correct the lump sum based on the uh, recommendations that we got from the experts, in which case the lump sum can indeed be lower than applied for. But there's also some other possibilities. For example, there can be obvious errors and inconsistencies that have not been detected during evaluation. There can be changes uh, necessary to apply to comply with rules, for example, if they, f there might even be changes in the consortium during grant preparation, this happens in any grant, not limited to lump sum grants. So, of course, changes like these need to be taken into account and uh, need to be made during grant preparation. But otherwise, the substance of the proposal is not changed before we sign the grant agreement. The detailed budget table that you created and that we used to justify and analyze the lump sum is uh, not part of your grant agreement. So the grant agreement effectively only has the breakdown of lump sum shares. In other words, an overview of the shares that uh, would go to each beneficiary in each work package once this work package is completed. All the many details that were leading to those shares are not part of the grant agreement. And we also remove other financial information in the grant agreement of lumps for lump sums because costs, actual costs are not relevant anymore after we have signed the grant. Once we have agreed the lump sum, 
this lump sum will not be questioned anymore. And therefore, actual costs and information on actual costs is not relevant. You should also not uh, ever report on actual costs in a lump sum grant. So for uh, the budget allocation and what this annex actually looks like, the annex I just mentioned that shows the overview of lump sum shares in your lump sum grant agreement. Here's an example. Uh, you see a case with four beneficiaries in the rows and eight work packages in the columns. Each work package has a total amount uh, for the grant and each beneficiary has a total amount. Not every beneficiary is participating in every work package. So we see that uh, each work package uh, yeah, is a sum of the shares of the beneficiaries that work in it. And the total for each beneficiary is the sum of the shares in the work package where they are participating. Um, now, this is, this is the schedule according to which the lump sum payments will be made. But of course, you can use the lump sum in any way you like, as the consortium like, as long as you agree, uh, as long as you carry out the work as agreed in the grant agreement. In actual fact, how you use the lump sum is entirely invisible to the commission because we are not reporting on actual costs. The only thing that you're reporting on is that you have uh, the work that you have done uh, and you will show that you have completed the work packages, in which case the amounts in the bottom row will be paid. Oops. I think there was, I think I have, um... okay, uh, let's go directly to the payment schedule now. There are three different types of possible payments. And again, these are the same and we use the same uh, timing. In other words, payments are made at the beginning of the project, a pre-financing. And the pre-financing has the same rules and the same function, uh, basically to provide the project with a float to get started. And the, co and the coordinator distributes it. There's really no difference to any other grant. Typically, many, many, I think most of our grants get... Uh, pre-financings of the size of 80% or 50% in this order of magnitude. So very uh, sizable pre-financing payment at the beginning of the project and there is no difference with any other grants. And then we have intermediate payments, one payment at the end of each reporting period. Depending on the number of reporting periods you have, you have as many interim payments. Um, and at that time, at the end of each reporting period, you report on the work packages that have been completed. If that is accepted, you get automatically paid for those work packages. And then at the end of the project, there's a final payment. Uh, at the final payment, we have the possibility to pay partially for partially completed work packages. In the intermediate payment, we don't do that because in case a work package has not been completed, maybe as planned, in an interim payment, we give the possibility to you to complete it at a later stage and then get paid for it at the very end of the project. Only in case that you have not been able to complete a project, uh, sorry, uh, you have not been able to complete a work package by the very end of the project. In this case, we have the possibility to pay for that work package partially. And of course, as in any other grant uh, at the end of the project, we'll also have the release of the amount that was retained for the mutual insurance mechanism. Uh, lump sum grants can also be amended in principle like any other grant. Um, they have in Horizon Europe at least the same procedure and conditions. You see here in the picture a number of examples, but that's not exhaustive. Uh, exhaustive. That's just uh, uh, a number of classic cases. For example, you can change the lump sum shares between partners and between work packages as long as that work package hasn't been already completed and paid, in which case, in which case we consider it uh, out of the equation. Any work package that yeah, you declared is complete and we paid it, uh, of course, cannot be amended anymore because that's in a way, yeah, that's the past. That's a done deal. We are not opening, we're not reopening that closed chapter of a uh, completed and paid work package. But all the rest of the work packages, of course, can be, uh, can be arranged. You can also um, make changes to the work plan as in any other grant. Um, well, any other uh, important 
changes are possible as in any other grant, I should say. If you still have a, a Horizon Europe, and no, sorry, if you still have a Horizon 2020 grant, we had slightly stricter um, procedure for um, amendments where you still needed a technical review to go along with that uh, with that uh, amendment procedure to make sure that you don't change the project in substance. Now, changing projects in substance is generally not allowed uh, in an amendment, and we use the same procedure and conditions now under Horizon Europe. Uh, you should maybe note that if you have uh, smaller deviations, uh, you can always also uh, report them in your standard technical report at the end of a reporting period. We call that the simplified procedure. This can introduce also, for example, a new subcontract or it can introduce uh, yeah, uh, changes in your work plan that you plan to do uh, because it's a necessary adjustment according to developments that were not known at the beginning of the project or when the proposal was written. This is perfectly normal and you can report on those deviations also, as I said, in your technical report. If the technical report gets accepted, uh, these changes are accepted with the technical report. And then in that case, you don't need uh, a formal amendment. Uh, reporting and payment. Of course, the, we, we said already the um, emphasis is on the technical reporting. Again, you have the standard uh, reporting template. In fact, it's exactly the same technical reporting template as you have in any other grant. There are a few sections that are not applicable to lump sum grants, notably those parts that relate to resources and costs. So those are marked also as not applicable for lump sum grants. But uh, so apart from that, the technical report is exactly the same and your technical report also focuses on the work packages and it justifies, explains why you consider that certain work packages have been completed. For the financial part, that is the easy part in lump sum grants. You basically just encode, the coordinator encodes, whether a work package was completed or not completed. And there is, uh, well, there is, uh, you, see a screen, you see a screenshot here uh, from the final reporting period, there you also have the possibility to declare work packages as partially completed. That's not possible in intermediate periods, but at the end you can report re uh, work packages as not completed. We hope, of course, that this is not the case, that you indeed completed all your work packages, partially completed or fully completed. And the um, again, I stress that a completed work package does not require that you were successful and that you achieved objectives. What's necessary is that you carried out the work and the tasks that were described in, that are described in the grant agreement. So, and with this input, we can then uh, carry out uh, the payment, which is uh, based on automated uh, financial statements. That is effectively as much simplified as possible. Uh, the system knows uh, the, uh, the lump sum shares for each work package uh, and which beneficiary was participating in it. So it can then uh, look up which work packages you declared as completed and which of those were accepted by the project officer. And on that basis can calculate, can generate the, uh, the payment. So you will then have um, for, in this case, for work package one, you have a payment of 350,000 euro because both beneficiaries completed the work. Work package two, in this case, is not paid because some work is has not been completed. Beneficiary C, C is still busy, so we cannot pay at this stage work package two, but work package three, again, is complete and will be paid at that stage. So you have two payments for work package one and three, while the other work packages will be paid at a later stage. Um, an important part now is, of course, what uh, do we do to, or what standards do we do, uh, do we apply to accept or reject work packages? Now, as a general rule, work packages will always be accepted when the activities have been carried out. I've been mentioning this already a couple of times. So that's the core principle of lump sum funding. You carry out the uh, you carry out the activities uh, that we agreed in the grant agreement. And once that's, uh, once that's done and accepted, we pay the pre-agreed 
lump sum share for that work package. However, this is not really set in stone and there is some room for maneuver because we can accept a work package also when essentially all tasks have been completed or when you have done equivalent tasks. In other words, when you deviated but you justified that deviation and uh, that is accepted. And indeed, if there are good technical reasons to deviate from the work plan, there is no reason to, accept, to expect that this should not be accepted. Uh, in general, we apply the very same standards to lump sum grants as to actual cost grants. So we do not expect that lump sum grants perform <clears throat> to a higher standard or they deliver more than any other grant. That is, that is uh, in a way, the, uh, the measuring stick. If uh, a grant would have been accepted under actual cost conditions, uh, the, the quality of implementation has been accepted, then that quality of implementation should and will also be accepted under lump sum conditions. Uh, of course, if you see that there are difficulties in completing some of your work packages, we encourage you to make use of the possibility to amend your work packages in time such that they are adjusted to the current technical scientific developments and such that you are able to complete them. Right, and then in case we get to the stage that a work package is that you consider complete, the project officer considers as incomplete. In that case, of course, you are still always invited to respond to the observations of the project officer. Uh, so there is, uh, you have the opportunity to explain why in actual fact you believe the work package is perfectly fine and complete. Uh, on that basis, the commission will take a final decision about the payment and in any case, if this happens at an intermediate stage, you will always have the possibility to uh, improve the implementation of that work package and be paid for it later. Well, we already mentioned at the very end, uh, you can have a partial payment. And this is uh, acceptable if there are really technical reasons that you didn't manage to complete the work package or force majeure. Um, so. The basis is that we normally expect that really all work packages are completed and fully paid. So this is really treated as an exception, where then as a result, the lump sum, the overall lump sum paid will be lower than the lump sum in the grant agreement because we decide together in consensus or uh, unilaterally if necessary on a percentage that is lower than the 100%. And this will be case by case depending on the degree of completion of the work package concerned. Now, in practice, what we see so far is that this happens quite rarely. And I would summarize that there is really no evidence, at least not so far, that there is a higher financial risk. Uh, the figures show that we've had roughly half of the work packages that were part of our lump sum pilot under Horizon 2020. Half of them have now been declared as complete. and. 99.4% of those were paid in full. There were just a few cases where uh, beneficiaries themselves declared them as partially completed. And there were only five cases where, and this was agreed consensually, and then there were very, very few cases, in fact, just five work packages where the commission unilaterally decided to pay them only in part. And I've seen some of those cases and I really think there are very, very good reasons, very uh, clear reasons for doing so. So I don't see any so far, I don't see any uh, evidence that we treat lump sum grants uh, in any way more strictly or that there is a higher financial risk of not being reimbursed. Ex post controls, as we said before, they cannot, uh, they cannot cover uh, they cannot cover financial aspects because actual cost is a concept that doesn't exist in lump sum grants. So there are no financial checks, reviews or audits, but any other aspect of the grant agreement can be checked and audited in exactly the same way as is the case for any other grant. You could also put your model grant agreement for a lump sum grant next to the one for an actual cost grant and you see uh, it is largely the same. All the obligations for all those non-financial obligations that we have are exactly the same. First of all, of course, this is the obligation to implement the grant properly, uh, and that can be covered in the general monitoring, technical checks and technical reviews. 
affects all grants and of course also lump sum grants. But all the, comp the, the compliance with all the other non-financial obligation is of course necessary for lump sum grants in exactly the same way as for any other grants. Some examples are the IPR obligations, uh, the open science obligation, uh, the obligation to disseminate and communicate about your grant, etc. In the event uh, that there are technical checks, uh, you need to keep, of course, records. And this is also the same obligation as in all grants. You need to have the documentation to prove that you actually carried out the grant. Uh, we, here are some examples uh, that could be technical documents. This could be documentation that you require under the principles of good research practices. For example, uh, lab notebooks or any other documentation that you have that shows that you actually carried out the grant. And this is exactly the same for all Horizon Europe grants. There is no difference for lump sum grants. So there is no extra document that you need to keep for lump sum grants that you wouldn't also have to keep for an actual cost grant. I need to stress that the obligation is the same. On the right hand side, however, uh, in a lump sum situation, you do not need to keep any timesheets and you don't need to have any evidence for the actual costs incurred, such as pay slips or contracts or invoices or a depreciation for the equipment used. Basically, any document that prove the actual costs that you had are not necessary. And the only caveat I have to make here is they are not necessary vis-a-vis -vis the Commission as part of the grant agreement that we signed. They are still necessary if you have any obligations under national law or if uh, things are necessary, documentation obligations exist under local procedures. This is, goes without saying, unaffected by the grant agreement uh, that you signed with the Commission or with an executive agency. Here. Uh, the principle is we are not going to check those things, but what you need to keep under national law or local procedures, that's a different matter and those obligations are not affected. Further information is available on one single page on the Funding and Tenders portal. We have created the lump sum page where we uh, put all the guidance and all the supporting material uh, for lump sum proposals and grants. You can also watch all the uh, events that we had. Uh, they are under, yeah, they are, they are part of that page. Uh, there's some background information, but the most important is that you can find all the guiding documents. You can also get access to the um, lump sum dashboard I mentioned. So this is the place to go to if you are looking for information also, of course, for future events. Uh, what we just added, and I would like to highlight that, is video tutorials for experts and applicants, and in fact, expert applicants and beneficiaries. I think anybody can benefit from those simple and short videos. Um, they are really meant uh, to help experts understand in a, in a short moment how lump sum funding is working and what they have to do. But since the principles are the same for everybody, you can really use them very usefully also if you are new to lump sum funding and you want to understand how it works. The first two of those videos are out already to give you an overview of lump sum funding and the key principles. And then the one on the detailed budget table and how it works. We are now preparing a third video on the personnel cost dashboard board and how it should be used. Of course, that's very important uh, for experts, but this could also be useful information for anyone preparing a lump sum proposal. What's happening next? We have uh, already done a couple of improvements that you see in place. We have uh, a higher page limit for lump sum proposals. This takes uh, into account that you can have split work packages despite the fact that you do not need to repeat the content when you split a work package, like in the example that we saw, you're not expected to repeat the content of that management work package three times, but still you will need a little bit more space when you go for splitting work packages. That's why we increased the page limit. We have just released uh, a few weeks ago an improved Excel tool uh, that you need to complete the budget table, that you need to complete the lump sum budget proposal. Um, that is a bit more user friendly. We've clarified the guidance even more and we've clarified some of the terms. We also clarified 
how this Excel table should be used together with the other forms. In particular, what values you should then actually enter into the budget table, into the simple budget table in part A of the proposal. And we just mentioned we now have the videos. We are working on the third one to have a complete set and, and cover basically the whole uh, range of aspects of lump sum funding in short videos. And then in general, we are uh, continuing to monitor lump sum funding because it's still relatively new. We realize that everybody is still on a learning curve, including the Commission and all the executive agencies. Uh, we've been doing this now since 2018, so it's not completely new anymore, but we are still learning. We, are, uh, we published an assessment already in 2021 of the lump sum pilot under Horizon 2020. Uh, a follow-up is in the pipeline. And, well, that hopefully will be published either by the end of the year or in Q1 2024. And uh, other than that, uh, I have some numbers here for how we were stepping, phasing in uh, lump sum funding into Horizon Europe. You see it was really very cautiously started with just 2% of the budget spent in the form of lump sums in the first two years of Horizon 2020. We go now uh, in 23, we do a jump to more than 10% and another jump in 2024 to uh, just over 20%. Where we go then from 2025 onwards, that's not decided yet. It's very possible that there will be further increases. Uh, we'll uh, need to decide this together with our stakeholders. Um, the Commission is quite ready to go for uh, further increases. Uh, we'll be in touch and discuss and we will see how far we go. We can't give you a figure at this moment, but we uh, are relatively happy with the lump sum experience so far and expect that there will be further growth. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and we can go to the second part of the webinar where we invite our external guests to share their experience with their ongoing lump sum grants. We did have now a session uh, with uh, three panelists. Um, we are very happy to have uh, with us uh, online three coordinators of uh, different lump sum projects uh, from Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, Silvia Gaggi, uh, Senior Project Manager uh, at ICINOVA in Italy, um, Gabriele Pieri, uh, researcher at the National Research Council of Italy, and Mihai Pop, Head of Operations at Transylvania IT Cluster, uh, in Romania. Um, so we will have uh, together a discussion uh, for about half an hour um, and I can already uh, tell you that um, our panelists will uh, stay with us uh, until the end of the event. So in case uh, you have uh, specific questions to address to them regarding their experience um, with LAMSAMS, uh, please uh, put your questions uh, in uh, Slido um, and we will allocate uh, uh, the questions to them. And I hope uh, the panelists are with us. Um, and I, I propose to, um, to start uh, with uh, some introductory questions for, for each uh, of the panelists. And I will uh, start with, uh, with Silvia. Um, could you uh, introduce yourself and the lump sum project that you coordinated under um, Horizon 2020? Uh, what was the project about, um, how many partners uh, were involved, so yeah, tell us a bit more. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. I hope I you can hear me you. well. Um, I'm Silvia Gaggi, I'm lead researcher at Disinova, a research and consulting institute based in Rome. Uh, we are very familiar with um, um, European research. Uh, we participate in European projects since uh, the 90s, uh, so the early framework programs. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have uh, a record of more than 100 projects we participate participated to or we managed ourselves. And uh, uh, the balance, this is the project I will uh, talk to you about, uh, was uh, uh, the first experience of, uh, of LAMSAMP. And it was also the first experience for our project officer, I have to say. So it was uh, quite a learning uh, uh, experience for, for both of us. Um, I prepared a, um, a couple of slides. I don't know if you can help me sharing or if I have to do it myself. 
I'm uh, waiting for instructions. We could see uh, uh, the screen, uh, so the slide. Mm. Okay, because I can't see, so I just trust you. <laughs> um, so yeah, rebalance, uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, I mean, few information about it uh, uh, was, uh, because we are talking about a project that uh, is finalized now. Uh, we ended it in uh, in uh, November last year. Uh, is a project about mobility and the, the future of the mobility culture. Uh, as you can see, it's a small project, uh, I mean, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in in the context of, uh, of European, of European uh, um, uh, research funding, uh, it's um, uh, two years duration, uh, less than one million uh, EU uh, contribution, um, a small partnership also, I mean, six partners uh, from uh, six European countries. Uh, so it's, um, it's quite, uh, quite, uh, quite a small um, uh, project that we had to manage and coordinate under the, the lump sum scheme. You can go to the next slide. And it's uh, you can see um, very very um, uh, briefly uh, how it was organized. I mean how the work was organized uh, to. Um, uh, work packages uh, um, over the whole duration of the project and three work packages uh, in a sequence, uh, which is quite important for the lump sum scheme, as we have seen in the introduction. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, to accompany our work, I mean, the state of the art of about uh, mobility culture, uh, the building of scenarios uh, for the future, selecting the one we prefer, building a vision, and then uh, producing in the final work package uh, the end results, the roadmap, and and, uh, a manifesto for, uh, for a wider audience. So, I mean, uh, uh, very simple, uh, very good experience with the, with the lump sum. I hope we I can share my experience uh, uh, in, uh, in the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. Um, I will turn now to Gabriele and ask a similar question. So could you uh, please introduce yourself and the project that you are coordinating uh, at what stage is now, uh, when did it start, and have you been already through uh, reporting and payments? Hello, hello, thanks as well for the invitation. Uh, okay, I'm Gabriele Pieri from the Institute of Information Science and Technology of the National Research Council uh, of Italy. I'm coordinating uh, Nautilus project. I hope I'm sharing the slides where I would like to give a brief description uh, of the project. Um, as a large institution, we have long experiences uh, in European project, but for us as well, it was the first lump sum project. Uh, Nautilus project is a project uh, dealing with uh, developing new technologies to fit for the ocean observation, to fill the gap in the observation of the ocean, uh, bringing and deploying uh, cost-effective technologies that needs to be integrated with the existing uh, observing platforms to establish long-term deployment all around the European seas. Our goals and the achievements we, are, uh, we want to achieve in our project is to complement and expand uh, the current EU observation tools and services so to, to obtain a higher uh, spatial resolution and temporal regularity of the currently available uh, data and information uh, at EU scale, at world EU scale. Obviously, we also want to democratize uh, the, um, the tools that are available because we have a strong effort in citizen science activities. And here is just a picture of all the uh, activities and the framework uh, we are working on in, uh, in our project. Um, uh, some info and the timeline. Uh, our project is an innovation action pilot. Uh, it was funded under the call uh, The Future Seas of the Ocean uh, as a flagship initiative. Uh, it is coordinated, as I mentioned, by National Research Council of Italy, which is uh, my institute plus other two institutes, but it has 21 partners spanning from all around Europe. It started uh, in October 2020, so in full COVID mode, let's say. Uh, it's lasting uh, four years, so it's uh, just started the uh, final year of our project. Uh, we already went through a first 
reporting period um, at month 18 and we are currently working uh, as we are at the end of the third year we are currently working and arranging towards the second reviewing period um, the contribution, the total contribution we asked in our project was around 9 million, so it's quite a medium-large project. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. Um, I will uh, now turn to, to Mihai and ask you to uh, introduce uh, yourself as well and the lump sum project that uh, you're coordinating. So uh, what, uh, what is it about? At what stage uh, is it now? Hi Andrea, thank you for the introduction. My name is Mihai Pop. I'm operations manager within Transylvania IT cluster, um, an associative structure that represents ITNC companies, more than 180 members, uh, mainly located in uh, the northwest part of Romania, but also spread in the other regions. Um, we're also working and um, uh, being an active organization um, on the European Commission um, work programs, trying to always make sure that we involve um, our company members within um, the projects and opportunities and support SMEs and startups in uh, having access to uh, mentorship uh, and at the same time uh, funding resources at the European level. Um, the project that uh, I am coordinating is Project Boost, um, funded through the European Innovation Ecosystems um, um, work program belonging to Horizon Europe. It's a coordination and support action type of project that has a budget of um, 500,000 um, euros, so I would say that it's, uh, it's a small-scale project. And the main aim that we have with the Boost is to increase the scope and efficiency of inter-regional collaboration among European innovation ecosystems with, uh, with the primary focus on Industry 4.0, clean tech green transition and health and well-being. Um, we've passed the halfway um, implementation period within, uh, within Boost. Uh, we submitted the interim report and we're still to, to receive the acknowledgement. And um, in terms of, of activities, it's, it's going good and we're looking very much at graphic uh, mediation um, um, tools. So working with some local artists in order to, to, to try to also um, translate all the conceptual um, and and, and uh, sometimes complicated and theoretical discussions into more digestible ma material, trying to, to bring in the stakeholders from uh, the project's regions, which are uh, Northwest Romania, Northeast Bulgaria, Estonia, South Denmark and Catalonia in, in Spain together um, to and, and the most recent um, activity that, that we organized was just this last weekend where during an innovation camp, we came up with a thematic of the, the joint action plan that needs to be the, the main output of the project, that we will focus it on building networking as a service collaboration framework. So trying to see how we can make more efficient the various networks existing already at European level and providing um, high quality, high added value services, networking services for our stakeholders within our regions, but also exporting it um, in other parts of Europe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mihai. Um, I propose now to uh, go to some specific questions uh, still for our panelists. Um, so um, I would like to ask, uh, some questions on the preparation of lump sum proposals. Um, and I will uh, turn to, to Mihai for, for this, for the first question. So my question uh, would be, um, in comparison to other proposals that you may have submitted, so to other projects that uh, you may have got, um, was it different to prepare uh, a lump sum proposal? So uh, um, did you see any difference uh, in that? And what would you advise other um, future applicants uh, uh, when writing their lump sum proposals? 
Um, well, I would say that there's, you know, there is no big difference in preparing in um, a lump sum a project or application um, compared to one that's based on real costs. And the, the thing is, just as it was in the uh, earlier initial presentation of the structure um, of, of the proposals, the budget is still there and pretty much similar to the budget for the real cost type of projects. Um, the difference actually kicks in after the proposal receives, if, if it receives a favorable um, evaluation. And then um, the, what the um, consortium organizations need to take into consideration is the fact that the amount of, uh, of resources that they have predicted uh, necessary for the completion of each work package will be the only remaining um, aspect in the grant agreement. So the, the cost structure uh, behind the efforts and resources that need to, to, to be committed to um, implement the activities and obtain the results and address the objectives um, are, are not there anymore. One thing that I would um, add and, and then close up this question is actually that after um, you know, we, we went into implementation, especially the large organizations, I would say here public institutions, universities and, and research centers, which have a, a higher degree of, um, I don't know, more rigid structure, so to say, had a hard time understanding that there is no budget lines, that there are no categories, it's just lump sum and they completely were not um, in favor, at least I think in the first six months of the uh, implementation, thinking that, you know, the money in a, the specific work package that we were working can be um, allocated according to the needs and not to the initial um, budget structure, which was no longer part of the grant agreement. Thank you. And uh, regarding the, the consortium um, of, uh, in your project, uh, what was your approach uh, in selecting the partners? Um, was it, uh, did it require a different uh, consortium agreement? Um, in, in terms of selecting the, the, the partners within the consortium, there is no um, difference, I would say, because eventually we're, we weren't looking for organizations or we ourselves are not an organization that is looking for Uh, rather, um, what we uh, what we seek was still the quality and relevance um, of organization towards the objectives and the scope of the project. Um, so here it's exactly um, the same, um, I, I would say. Then in terms of the consortium agreement, we actually use the model that was um, recommended to us and that we've seen uh, also in other European projects that we were part of. Um, started from, I think it was the DESCA model, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and then we adapted it to the, to the reality of the lump sum um, project because we eliminated all the, all the articles that were in relation to, to the financial um, reporting, tracking of, of real um, costs and everything else. And then we just followed the uh, provisions of the grant agreement in terms of the fact that um, we receive, for instance, 80 percent of uh, pre-financing after signing the grant agreement and then um, uh, pay, pay the remaining 20 percent after the after the, the, the approval of the final report and unblocking of the insurance mechanism. OK, thank you very much, Mihai. Um, I will turn now to the project management part and I have a question for uh, Gabriele. Um, so from your experience so far, uh, would you say that the reporting for your project became uh, easier thanks to the use of uh, lump sum funding? Um, also, if you have to compare it to other uh, projects uh, uh, in which you may have participated. So what is your experience with uh, the reporting? Okay, yes, uh, I think that uh, in financial terms, of course, it is much, much easier. Uh, I would second uh, uh, Mihai's opinion about uh, the, the, um, the difficulties in dealing with, uh, with large organizations, for instance, the one I mean, 
to, to cope uh, not only with this novel uh, administrative uh, way, but we also, from our side of research, we have to understand that large organization has to deal at the same time with both types of uh, project financial, so lump sum and actual cost. So uh, having those two at the same time could bring some more difficulties also in uh, for for in their respect. Uh, but in general, for uh, let's say from a coordinator point of view and the partners point of view, for sure, the financial reporting is really really um, made easier in respect to the previous. Um, actual cost reporting. In terms of uh, reporting, uh, obviously the major focus where we all concentrated during our first uh, review was about uh, the completion of the work packages, uh, the drafting on the deliver of the deliverables, which are really, really important and has a major focus in these uh, lump sum projects. And uh, I think it was uh, positive uh, as the outcome of the review and also the, the evaluation of the project officer and external experts was positive with respect to the to the documents and the proposal evaluation. Thank you. And uh, one more question. Uh, did your uh, project uh, require any amendments? Um, and if yes, uh, how uh, did uh, this process go? Yeah, we had uh, two amendments uh, during the, the first uh, three years actually of the project. Uh, the first one was uh, kind of easy one, not specifically related with budget changes because there, we found out some leftovers from the proposal as the, let's say, the grant agreement preparation was strongly focused on budget adjustments. Uh, so we, we wanted to, um, to change some, some of these leftovers that we identified during the first phase of the project. But the second one was also concerning budget. There was uh, mainly a, a shift of uh, tasks, activities from one partner to another, and some activities uh, from one uh, task to another. Uh, but the amendment was uh, was achieved with not a great effort. There was a good exchange among uh, uh, the partners and from the coordinator towards the commission and the project officer. And um, I could declare that yeah, they, they worked as expected and uh, they were approved. Thank you very much, Gabriele. Um, I will turn now to, to Silvia for the last uh, round of questions. Um, and so from your experience, since you have also finalized uh, the, the Lamsam project, um, to what extent was the management and the administration uh, of the project easier due to the fact that uh, you did not uh, need to re to report on actual costs and uh, resources? Well, my experience was uh, really good. I, I think uh, the lump sum simplifies, uh, um, uh, it, it's a safe time. Uh, uh, in other projects, uh, we normally uh, always had to, to uh, carry out some training uh, on how to make uh, the financial uh, um, declarations. Um, many partners uh, are not familiar with the with the portal. There are plenty of tricks uh, that you uh, need to. Uh, even we, that we are uh, well experienced, we <laughs> always find new tricks uh, to um, uh, to solve. Uh, so it was really um, made it easy. I mean, you tick uh, uh, the work packages that you have completed uh, and, and, uh, and it's done. And also uh, many back and forth with the commission. Uh, I mean, asking for clarifications about payments, about uh, small details. So, so it was really uh, much uh, smoother and it uh, allowed to really concentrate on the content of, uh, of the project and less on the administration and the administrative part. So it's a, a, a big improvement uh, from my point of view. Okay, thank you. And one last question for you. Uh, it's about uh, the, the payment. So um, did you receive the full lump sum in the end or was there a partial payment? And uh, generally, what would you advise um, other lump sum coordinators regarding the management of their grant? 
Uh, we re received the full amount. Uh, we were able to uh, complete our work, uh, to submit all deliverables uh, uh, in good quality, so no problem to receive uh, the full payment. Um, as I said, for us, it was a good experience. Maybe also, I mean, uh, the fact that it was a small project uh, um, made it easier. Um, but again, I, I have no comparisons. It was the, uh, the first experience uh, as coordinator and as uh, partner in a uh, lump sum uh, project. Um, what I would say more than for the management, uh, for me, is the preparation of the of the proposal. Uh, once you settle the work plan uh, um, well and uh, and the budget uh, uh, well at the at the very beginning, and as my colleagues uh, pointed out before, uh, you include clauses in the grant in the consortium agreement, sorry, uh, for liability among the partners. Uh, then the management uh, is. Um, it's much easier than uh, than uh, in normal uh, uh, funding schemes. Thank you very much uh, for sharing some of your experiences. And uh, I suggest now that maybe we start to look at the questions uh, from Slido. And in case there are some uh, questions, we can also ask you, uh, the panelists, to, to jump in. So Ulrich, you would like to start? Yeah, I can I can try and start and then we take turns in answering these questions. Uh, but indeed, uh, if our panelists can help us answer any questions, um, then that is very, very welcome. So first question is actual cost to deliver lump sum project can be lower than the lump sum received. Theoretically generating profit is that allowed now? Yes, that is very theoretical because what we hear is, uh, if anything, the funding is too little than too much, not only for lump sum grants, but in general. So the overwhelming feedback is that uh, the, the funding that consortia get for their project is rather at the lower limit uh, than too much. So a situation where somebody can complete the whole project and generate a profit, that should be extremely rare and a theoretical case but however if it happened and again i'd say that's for me a theoretical case yes that is allowed that would be the same case as if you let's say have a uh, a flat rate for travel or a flat rate for accommodation the commission is using these for example also in other areas if uh, then you don't go uh, and uh, if you then don't book a hotel but you go to the youth hostel uh, the the difference is indeed not taxable and in fact nobody will see it because it was a flat rate for accommodation so uh, but I insist this is a rather theoretical case also through the evaluation of course we make sure that lump sum grants as any other grants don't get too much funding yes um... So the question is, do you have an overview of the typical number of work packages in successful uh, lump sum projects? Normally, we see 8, 10 work packages. Is the new form uh, plus minus 15 or even higher? Um, so here I would like to say that we don't, uh, we don't recommend a typical number of work packages. Uh, because this depends uh, mostly on the nature of the of the project, so um, also on on the duration of the projects, on the on the consortium, so how big it is, how many partners are involved, and uh, what is the complementarity between uh, the partners as well. So how can they contribute? And of course, each each project is is unique, um, but. Uh, uh, as uh, Ulrich also was mentioning in the uh, presentation, uh, indeed there is the possibility to split some work packages, uh, mostly the horizontal ones, uh, the work package for project management, um, for communication and dissemination, to align it with the future reporting periods. Uh, but this is something that we uh, mostly recommend for projects uh, with a long duration, so uh, more than three years. Uh, because usually for uh, projects that are uh, up to three years, uh, they receive uh, already uh, a, a generous uh, pre-financing, so it's 80%. So that should um, that should be uh, okay for the for the consortium for the project to to go on implementing uh, the activities. Thank you. So the next question: 
uh, how rigidly do evaluators apply dashboard figures? Anecdotally, suggested reactions to staff costs by reviewers is causing partners to withdraw at GAP. Now, first question, we very clearly state and brief experts and everybody that the dashboard is an orientation. It is not to be applied strictly and indeed costs that are above the dashboard figures are perfectly acceptable if justified. Now I've already also heard uh, from a few complaints. What I haven't seen is whether these uh, and cannot judge at this time if these complaints are justified or not because well if we have cases, and I said we have few cases, even though the majority of our lump sum grants go through without cuts, but there are some cases with cuts. So um, it is possible that these cuts were unjustified. It is equally possible that these cuts were very justified. So in case, for example, that somebody has much higher costs than is uh, would be in line with the distribution of the dashboard and doesn't provide a clear explanation why that is needed, that would be indeed a case where the expert would be expected to cut those costs, which is uh, applicable now in those uh, cases in grant preparation. I don't know. In the data that we looked at recently uh, of grants that have already been signed. So this would not include the ones which are in grant preparation right now, but the grants looking at only lump sum grants that have been signed up until now, we see really very, very few and very low cuts so far. So uh, that this, uh, well, in other words, so far we see absolutely no reason why anybody would uh, even consider withdrawing, but uh, we'll definitely keep monitoring this issue. Next. Yes, so uh, how do you measure the percentage of implementation of a work package? Uh, you said you focus on the activities implemented rather uh, than uh, on outcomes, but we report deliverables uh, results. Um, so uh, the project officer will, uh, uh, will assess the, the degree of uh, completion of the work package uh, at, at uh, the end of the reporting period. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, the focus will be on the activities that were completed, and this is based on the uh, on the deliverables that you submitted, on the technical uh, report. So everything uh, is assessed uh, on that. Uh, I don't know if you, Ulrich, would like to add something. Yeah, maybe I would. I would say yes. Of course, you report on deliverables, but you definitely also report on the work that you carried out. A deliverable does not require that there was a, a positive result. So I like to use the example of a clinical study. Indeed, we would like to see that the clinical study took place and then you report on the fact that it took place, but we do not expect that the clinical study had a positive outcome in that it maybe proved a certain intervention is effective. If the result of that clinical study is uh, whatever was tried is uh, entirely useless, uh, we will still, so in other words, uh, there is no progress scientifically or in, in, in terms of an improved treatment. We would, of course, still pay the uh, cost for that study because that's what was agreed in the grant agreement and uh, the study itself took place. And I would say, indeed, you would, uh, on that basis, be absolutely able to report and complete your deliverables and complete your technical reports, even with a negative outcome. Next question. And that is luckily a very easy one for me to answer. Do we need timesheets for personnel costs? No, you don't need timesheets as far as your contractual relationship with the commission is concerned. You may need personnel, you may need timesheets if that is the policy of your organization. So we've heard this also before that, uh, yeah, now that, uh, now that in lump sum grants we don't need timesheets anymore, our organizations are still using them. Now that may be the case, but then that is not because the commission is asking for it. This is because uh, an organization may or may not have internal rules on using timesheets. But the clear answer for uh, as far as the grant agreement that you sign is concerned, no, you don't need them. Good. Next question. Okay. Are lump sum projects subjected to audits during implementation? 
Uh, so as uh, Ulrich already presented there, uh, I'd like to mention again, uh, there are no financial uh, checks, reviews and audits uh, done by the, by the Commission for the lump sum project. Um, of course, it, it may be that uh, your project is subject to a technical review during the implementation uh, in which all, uh, the deliverables, uh, technical reports will be assessed. Uh, but uh, no, there are no financial audits. Maybe I would like to add that uh, on this audit question, the general rule is exactly the same as always. Uh, our projects, um, and this is the article in the grant agreement is also the same, the projects can be subject to checks, reviews, audits and investigations um, during the project and uh, up to a certain number of years after the project. And that is the same for all our projects. So there's nothing new, nothing special for lump sum grants. The difference is that in case of lump sum grants, these checks, reviews, audits and investigations cannot concern the financial aspects, but it, they can concern any other aspect. Right, next question. Um, if a work package is partially completed and paid, who will establish how each of the beneficiaries contributed to it? How to decide how much each beneficiary should be paid? Now, indeed, that is, uh, uh, first of all, a decision for the consortium to take. But, uh, and we've also described that in the guidance that you find back on the page uh, where we provided the link to. Uh, indeed, you get payment information and that is resolved per beneficiary for each payment. In case there is a reduction like that, there can be two cases. There can be either a case where it is clear which beneficiary is responsible for the non-delivery or for the incomplete delivery of a work package. And in that case, uh, the reduction will be assigned to that particular beneficiary. And there may be cases where it is not clear uh, who of the participating beneficiaries uh, is responsible for the non-delivery or partial delivery. And in that case, it is for the consortium. In that case, the uh, partial payment will be made for that work package overall. And uh, each beneficiary participating in that work package will, be, will have their share reduced in, in proportion to their part in that work package. Okay, um, next question. Um, in a lump sum project where you have a detailed budget table and goes by unit costs, what is the flexibility in spending the budget as stated in the table? Um, first of all, I would like to clarify uh, uh, that a unit cost, as uh, they were present in the Excel uh, file, uh, is not the same uh, with uh, the unit cost as a model of funding. So in uh, uh, the older version of, uh, of the Excel tool, we had cost per unit and we referred to it as the cost for a given uh, item for uh, uh, a resource. And now this is uh, clarified in the, uh, in the version uh, that we currently have for the Excel file to not have this confusion. Um, and uh, the second part of the question, so what is the flexibility in spending the budget as stated in the table? Uh, well, as, um, as soon as the, the grant agreement is signed and the lump sum is fixed, so uh, you can spend the budget uh, as you see fit. Uh, how you actually spend, uh, spend the money uh, is invisible to us, so uh, uh, we don't see it because you don't report on actual uh, costs and resources. Uh, but again, if you may need to, uh, to do some uh, budget uh, transfers uh, between work packages or between beneficiaries, uh, so you, are, uh, you can do that. And if you want to formalize it in the, um, uh, in the grant uh, agreement, so you, you will change uh, the description of the action. So you need to do an amendment for that. And uh, the, the procedure is the same as for any other uh, grant. Maybe I'm not sure if that was already very clear uh, because there is sort of a wrong assumption in this. There was a wrong assumption in this question. No, in the lump sum project, you do not have a detailed budget table. The detailed budget table is used exclusively in the lump sum proposal. This is the stage when we 
define and justify the lump sum. In the lump sum project, in other words, in the lump sum grant, there is no such table. In the lump sum grant, you only have the overview of lump sum shares. So all the details are not part of your project. They are exclusively there in the proposal and evaluation stage. Just, I'm not sure if that was entirely clear. So, uh, next question again is a relatively easy one for me. When the DESCA model for lump sum will be released? Now, uh, what I hear from the DESCA colleagues is there is going to be a launch event for that early in 2024, either uh, end of January or early February. So, um, that is the information that I have, but of course, uh, for authoritative information on that, uh, you would need to ask Deska. Okay, next question. Um, budget decrease proposed by the evaluators. Is it possible to prove, negotiate in gap, uh, a real amount of personal costs by pay slips to avoid a budget decrease? Um, so, uh, what we normally say is that um, uh, during uh, grant agreement preparation, there is no uh, uh, negotiation being done. So this principle applies as for any other ground in Horizon Europe. Um, but of course, some exceptional changes may still uh, happen at this stage uh, regarding the budget. And uh, in, yes, indeed, if you uh, have a strong reason, uh, you you can of course uh, submit uh, some. Um, some documents and you can be in touch with the uh, project officer for that and this is a, a decision on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, uh, so yeah, technically it, it is possible to submit this but it's rather exceptional. Yeah, I would really say as a general rule the no negotiation uh, takes uh, is, is really meaning, it really means that you don't renegotiate the, uh, the budget at that stage. Um, there's always the possibility that you uh, submit a redress. So you received, you were invited for grant preparation. You see that there were certain cuts. You do not agree with the method in which those cuts were decided. In other words, you are saying there was a mistake during evaluation. And then you can indeed submit a redress. Redresses can not only be used in case the uh, the proposal was rejected. You can also submit a redress in case it was selected for funding, but with certain decisions that you disagree with. That would, in fact, be the uh, the formal uh, approach. Um, well, currently, the corporate approach in our lump sum schemes in all programs not limited to Horizon Europe is that uh, at that stage, we don't negotiate the lump sum anymore. This is, this is sort of, the, we take the result of the evaluation and implement it. But as uh, Andrea said, there may be exceptional case-by-case -case, uh, uh, situations where uh, the responsible authorizing officer decides to deviate from that principle. So uh, I think we had a similar question before. How do you define the percentage of completion of a work package and who bears the responsibility to do so? Basically, the coordinator bears more responsibility than actual costs. Well, no, I don't really agree because uh, you have the obligation to complete work packages also under actual costs. The idea that uh, you can, that you have to complete all the tasks under uh, lump sums and that you can just as well not complete your tasks as described in the grant agreement under actual cost, that is definitely wrong. If we find that under actual cost your, compl your implementation of the grant is incomplete, the grant is cut. In, then as a result you also are paid less or the maximum is lower. In other words, you still have to define the cost in that case, but uh, the maximum is lowered and in other words uh, the practical effect is the same of incomplete uh, delivery of the work that was promised in the grant agreement. Now, how to define the percentage? Yes, I agree that there is no algorithm. It's not, uh, it's not totally obvious. It's going to be a case-by-case -case decision, but indeed there are possibilities to simply look and at the description in detail and count what activities have been delivered and which activities have not been delivered. Uh, some of the examples where we had cuts so far, for example, concern um, 
funding to linked third parties, in other words, cascading grants. And we had a case where only where well, 20 cascading grants were planned and only 19 cascading grants have been executed. So it was a relatively easy exercise to calculate the cut because, well, 5% of that has simply not been implemented. Um, it might be more difficult in other cases, that's clear, but uh, and it will not be an exercise that can be accurate to the euro, but uh, that can also not be the aim here. The aim is to correct for an incomplete delivery uh, and to arrive normally consensually to a percentage that both consortium and commission can agree on. Okay, next question. Um, in the model grant agreement uh, for lump sum, Article 25.1.3, is written then that accounts, individual salary statements uh, can be requested. This is not in line uh, with what uh, heard this morning. Um, indeed, uh, we know that uh, this article uh, brings uh, some confusion and uh, we have actually um, uh, created an FAQ to uh, clarify a bit and uh, so yes under uh, the lump sum grant agreement there is no obligation uh, to keep records on the actual costs incurred but as uh, also mentioned previously you might uh, you might still be uh, um, you might still have the obligation to to keep those records those financial records uh, for uh, uh, internal uh, procedures or by your national law and uh, and what is uh, um, what is requested in Article Twenty Five One Point Three? So individual accounts and so on can also uh, uh, be used um, to verify that a certain part of the work has been done, um, and also this. Uh, these accounts might also be verified in case of, a, of an inve investigation that is uh, related to fraud suspicion. Uh, so, and this may, might happen for any, any grant in Horizon Europe. Yeah. I would like to add this article, I, I fully agree, is not, uh, is not drafted in the clearest possible way. And we will see if uh, there are ways to uh, improve clarity of that. But what's also in there is that it says, uh, you know, you need to, um, you, you could be requested to submit these things, but in line with your grant agreement. And then your grant agreement says very clearly in another place that you have no obligation to keep financial records. So, uh, and that's, uh, that might be confusing, but what's basically, what, what this article basically says, those uh, financial records that exist, maybe due to national regulations or to local procedures, those might indeed be uh, seen by the auditors, for example, the European Court of Auditors and uh, OLAF, for example, they retain the right to audit any grant that is given by the EU to anybody. So they will, they have right to access, uh, to audit the expenditure. Um, but this does not mean this article does not mean that you now have to provide financial records for the lump sum project specifically. It is just you may need to give access to your accounts, salaries and, and, and these things that are mentioned that exist in your organization in general. And this can indeed be requested in case uh, of uh, suspicion of fraud, for example, is, is one example. But yeah, we, we all agree this article has led to confusion and uh, we, uh, as Andrea said, we published an FAQ to clarify the meaning. We hope that we can, uh, in the future, improve the wording in the model grant agreement itself. Okay, a next question. How many reporting periods should you plan for in a lump sum project for a 36 months and a 48 months project respectively? You should normally plan exactly the same number of reporting periods as in any other grant. So the 18-month rule applies. Uh, we normally minim we normally the standard uh, reporting period is 18 months in Horizon Europe, and we use the minimum number of reporting periods. That is two reporting periods for 36 months and three reporting periods, like in fact in the example uh, we saw for splitting work packages in the presentation, three reporting periods for a 48-month project. There can be exceptions, so I'm, I'm stressing this is the normal approach, 
uh, because there can be exceptions in case that projects are considered uh, high risk or certain beneficiaries participating are considered as high risk, then there can be, as a measure of reinforced monitoring, uh, the project officer, the uh, authority managing the grant can decide to have one or two more reporting periods to have a closer monitoring of that particular project. But the standard approach is based on this 18 months rule, meaning you'd have two for 36 and three reporting periods for 48 months. Okay, next question. Lamsam invites the creation of many small work packages so that they can be considered completed and thus uh, reimbursed. Not efficient project management. Um, here I would like to stress again uh, the fact that uh, splitting work packages is not mandatory. So it's a possibility that you have when designing your, uh, your proposal, your project. And especially if uh, you plan that your project will last for uh, a long time, so for, for more than three years. Uh, and also in this case, if you decide to, to split uh, certain work packages, you still need to make sure that uh, the resulting work packages still uh, make sense uh, as a whole, so they are still a, a major subdivision of the work. We don't want to see uh, uh, work packages uh, for every single activity or every single task. So uh, please, uh, yes, take this into consideration. Yeah, I would really stress uh, the creation of many small work packages is not invited and not encouraged. And indeed, if you create too many, too small work packages, that might indeed be penalized by the experts during evaluation. Because uh, what counts is that the work plan is still effective and that the work packages still make sense as a sizable subdivision of the project, not as tiny packages of individual tasks. So that you need to take into account when designing your lump sum proposal. Next question. Can the subcontracting or goods and services costs be moved to personal costs during implementation without amendment? Yes. Basically, there are no cost categories in lump sum grants. The only thing that you need to report to us is and that you need to prove if, if there's an in-depth review, is that you carried out the work. There is no monitoring or no reporting of those costs, so even these cost categories mentioned in this question do not exist in a lump sum grant as far as the commission and or the implementing or the, the service uh, managing the grant is concerned. So, Yes, uh, even you couldn't, if you did an amendment, it wouldn't be clear what you would amend. That's uh, an amendment of a uh, lump sum grant. The only thing that you, in terms of finances, that you can do is you can absolutely shift lump sum shares between work packages and between partners. But there is no resolution, there is no information on what cost categories in the traditional sense of an actual cost grant are covered by those lump sum shares. In a lump sum grant, we just have these lump sum shares and they are for the work described in the corresponding work package. I hope that clarifies that question. Yes, um, so let's go to the next one. Interim payment. If beneficiaries have completed all the work necessary for a work package, but the associated partners involved have not, will beneficiaries still be paid? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Um, so as the associated partners, uh, they uh, indeed do not uh, sign the grant agreement. Uh, they uh, will not be visible in the uh, distribution of the lump sum, lump sum shares because they don't receive uh, uh, EU funding. Um, but uh, I would say, so if uh, they have, uh, they are involved in a work package, so they have uh, some activities um, uh, that they need to, to do, they need to implement. Uh, in that case, uh, the work package uh, does not seem complete to me. So, um, so it, it might still be completed later on uh, at, at, at the subsequent uh, in, uh, reporting period. Um, so this is how I would uh, see the things. What do, do you say, Ulrich? Yes, I mean, if an associated partner, even though they are not receiving any budget, if they have been described as an essential part of a work package, this work has also got to be delivered, I would say. 
that's uh, that's irrespective of uh, the, what's 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 counting is what is the description for that work package in the grant agreement, and is is that there is it has it been completed yes or no. Um, Who's actually involved? I mean, that's a, that's another question, but will not affect the decision on whether it's complete or incomplete. So yes, associated partners absolutely also. Uh, or there is the obligation also to deliver what has been recorded, what has been agreed for the associated partners. Next question, and uh, here I think it's not entirely clear what is meant. What about the risk for host institutions? Will they risk letting go of the current accounting rules and external audits, knowing any project might fail? Now, that is a very unclear and suggestive question, more half a statement. I'm sorry, I can't really answer that. Uh, uh, I would say uh, in this knowing any project might fail, I might like to comment because, uh, well, indeed, there is no guarantee uh, up front that the lump sum will be paid in full, but this is the same in an actual cost grant. You have no guarantee that the maximum amount will be paid. The, the grant can be cut for exactly the same reasons, namely that you have not met all the obligations or that you have not properly implemented it. So um, I, uh, I don't really understand the question and how it relates to lump sum funding. Next question. Do the timesheets are still compulsory in a lump sum project? What about the audit? Is it an audit only technical? So this are, uh, is a question that already uh, has been answered, but just to, to, to repeat. Uh, so uh, timesheets uh, are not uh, compulsory in a lump sum project. So uh, there is no obligation uh, by the commission uh, to, to report on uh, on resources on timesheets, uh, um, so you don't need to keep that. Uh, but of, again, for internal procedures, national law, you might still need to to keep it. And again, for the audit, uh, it, it's the same uh, as for uh, any other grant. So, uh, as regards the non uh, financial obligations, so. Um, uh, and for lump sums, there is uh, not going to be a financial uh, check, review, uh, and audit. And you know, in case of audits or reviews, there will, your timesheets will not be needed. Indeed, the the whole checking, monitoring, reviewing, and auditing is focusing on the technical aspects or on the non-financial obligations. So, in any event, uh, uh, these checks, reviews, audits they will never ask for your timesheets. Next question. Is the entire consortium punished if one part fails to deliver its deliverables or complete the work packages? Uh, yeah, I partially answered that, I think, because if, uh, if it is clear which, man uh, which uh, beneficiary is responsible for the non-delivery, then indeed we will also take that into account and will be clear in the payment information where the grant, where the work package was cut. However, this is not always clear. And indeed, uh, I, should remember, I should remind you that the consortium is collectively responsible to deliver the project and to implement it properly. So if it is impossible for the commission to identify which beneficiary was uh, responsible, or in fact, when it's clear that the whole consortium was responsible, then indeed the cut will be at the level of the whole work package or even at the level of the whole grant. And in that case, of course, everybody will, uh, the grant will be, well, everybody will lose in proportion of that cut. So it really depends on whether the responsibility uh, for the non-delivery, for the uh, not for the for the non-met uh, obligations can be established or not. And again, I invite you to read the examples that we have published in the lump sum guidance that you can find back on the lump sum page on the participant portal. Okay, next question. If the if the work package is accepted only partially, who defines which partner has not done their part? Or is there a joint liability for the deduction uh, in this case? 
No, I think we've really answered that uh, twice now. Yes. Um, yes, I think we go for the next question. That's, that's the same answer as before. Okay, uh, next one. Concerning the evaluation of personal costs, there is an important variation in costs before 2021 and after uh, due to inflation, etc. How to account for that? Um, well, uh, as uh, I, I'd like to stress again that uh, uh, so in the evaluation of personal costs, experts uh, will use the, the dashboard for personal costs and the data in this dashboard uh, is based on uh, grants uh, in Horizon Europe, actual cost grants in Horizon Europe. So the data, uh, it is from 2021 onwards. Uh, but indeed, uh, it, uh, there might be uh, changes, of course, due to inflation and uh, due to some other reasons. And how to deal with this? Uh, well, if, you're, um, if your costs are um, higher than what is it in, in the dashboard, so the dashboard value, um, the, the 18th uh, percentile, you should uh, justify uh, the costs. And uh, you can do that in the Any Comments tab of the Excel file. Uh, at the moment when you uh, uh, prepare your proposal, when you prepare your budget. And experts are instructed to take uh, uh, this into consideration when they do their assessment. And again, very important, the this personal cost dashboard is uh, only indicative, so uh, uh, experts will uh, will base their assessment also on other factors. Maybe to add that inflation and salary rises is one of the reasons that we explicitly point out as possible reasons for higher costs, for higher uh, personnel costs. But of course, you still need to then justify, uh, given that the the standard data, the uh, in the dashboard are from 21 onwards, and in 21 the Commission signed hardly any grants. Uh, the, the vast majority of grants that are the backbone of this dashboard are from 22 and 23. So you would then of course have to justify why in comparison with those 22, 23 data you still have these much higher costs. Why inflation? Because in the question I understand uh, you see a divide between 2021 20, and before. So um, inflation is mentioned and should be taken into account and uh, salary rises uh, that come as a result of it. But uh, you would still uh, you would still have to explain that in your proposal that specifically for you uh, this is uh, such an important factor that you are that your costs are above the 80th percentile. Next question. The budget table in Excel, do you plan to integrate tables into the portal when? Just a rough idea, e.g. it certainly won't be by the end of 2024. Well, um, it's indeed difficult to speculate. It's a complicated IT project. We are indeed on it um, and we are doing the first tests and see how this could work. Um, there's also in fact people uh, and, and stakeholders, external stakeholders who say they like the Excel table maybe better than having it integrated in the portal because the Excel table is more easily shared between beneficiaries during proposal preparation. But uh, we overall see that there's an advantage of uh, that it would be better to have it as part of the electronic submission system integrated in the portal. We fully agree there, given the complication of doing it. Yeah, this will indeed probably take some more time. And end of 2024 or early 2025 is, is a first target, but too early for me to speculate when it will really be delivered. Next question, um, transfers of money between work packages or partners always require a technical amendment, even if the consortium doesn't want to reflect it in the grant. Um, I think also we provided the answer, but I can um, um, mention it again. So uh, if you uh, decide to do a transfer between a budget transfer between work packages or between beneficiaries, uh, you don't uh, require an amendment uh, because uh, we would anyway we, we don't see how you actually spend uh, the money. Uh, but uh, of course, if the consortium uh, would like to reflect it in the ground, an amendment uh, should be done. And uh, this, uh, I would say, it's also a, 
advisable to do uh, in order to reflect also the financial liability of the partners. So in case uh, if this in, in case these budget transfers happen. Yeah, I really uh, I mean this question seems to be a misunderstanding. There is no obligation whatsoever in any situation to make an amendment to change the lump sum shares that are fixed in Annex 2 of your lump sum uh, gra grant agreement. You may do this if you like, if you want, if the situation has changed and you want to, let's say, align what's in Annex 2 with the reality of how you spend the budget among the partners. That is an option, that is a maybe, it's entirely up to the consortium to decide if they want to do that or not. As far as the Commission is concerned, uh, you will get the lump sum and the full lump sum if the grant is implemented. So if you are sufficiently confident that you will implement the grant, there's, you could say there's no reason to do any such amendments because the total amount that you will get in the end is the same. But for it's more for internal purposes and for internal management that the consortium might want to reflect the reality of how they distribute the money among partners in the grant agreement. And then if they want to do that, they are very welcome to uh, initiate such an amendment. Next question. Can there be financial audits of the Court of Auditors checking real costs or OLAF audits? Uh, well, yes and no. There can be audits of the Court of Auditors and there can be also audits of OLAF, but these cannot check financial costs. I mean, the, these cannot check uh, financial aspects. In other words, they cannot check real costs because you have a grant agreement that verifies that you do not have to keep any of those. But as we said before, in relation to Article 25.1.3, for example, in the case of fraud suspicion, so extremely exceptional cases, Olaf and the Court of Auditors could ask for access to your accounts, but even then, since you have no obligation to keep records on that particular project, they would not, if, if these accounts, if these records do not exist, there is no problem, but they might still check, they would have the right, as we saw in 21, uh, 13, 25, 13, uh, they would still have access to the information that exists in your accounts. But not specifically to any uh, financial records relating to the lump sum project because there are no obligation for you to keep any. Good, next question. If you always cut to the 80%, the 80% uh, value will always decrease in the future. Costs above the 80% must also be allowed, otherwise the system will not work. So here, I suppose uh, you are mentioning to the personal cost dashboard, um, but I think it's a misunderstanding. So um, as mentioned already, uh, the values, uh, the, the, man the monthly rates that are um, above 80% uh, for the uh, average personal costs are very uh, well uh, accepted. Uh, so um, it's, it's normal to have them. Uh, but as always, uh, you need to justify uh, the cost and this is also in general, so you need to justify your cost and especially if they're um, higher uh, than uh, the values uh, uh, in the dashboard. I'd like to add that, again, there's a slide, I mean, I see what the question means, but there is a misunderstanding in the question because the data that we use to construct the dashboard, and this will stay for that for quite some time, are entirely based on actual cost grants. Now, in actual cost grants, we do not apply the dashboard, at least not so far. So uh, you don't have this mechanism. So the, the source of the data is the actual cost world, because the idea is the costs that we pay in actual cost grants and that we pay in lump sum grants, that should be the same. The, if you, a given project, a given activity should receive the same amount of funding under actual costs and under lump sums. That's why it is entirely justified to look at what is the kind of costs that we see are agreed and put in the grant agreement in actual cost grants. There we have those values available in our database and expect uh, that lump sum grants use similar values. But the, what happens in the lump sum world has no influence on the values in the dashboard. 
So this mechanism that is suggested here, if we always cut to the 80%, which we don't do, uh, then uh, even if we did, it would not uh, change the dashboard because the dashboard is not based on the lump sum values. It's based on the actual cost values. But I can only stress, uh, can only stress again what Andreas said, we do not cut always at the 80%. Indeed, 80% and above is entirely possible, but we expect in the lump sum situation that you justify it. Next question. Are existing consortium agreements successfully used in current or past lump sum projects available as example for new projects that just have been awarded? That may be the case, but not from the Commission. The Commission is not really entering into the consortium agreement because it's an agreement that we are not part of. So uh, there is the DESCA model. We mentioned that DESCA is expected to um, roll out a lump sum model in the near future. But of course, uh, that is the uh, that you would have to uh, contact DESCA for more information. Next question. Um how do we deal with liability and risk in the grant agreement? Uh, is there any guidance before the DESCA model comes out in February? Uh, so, first of all, on, on this point, we have also published uh, an FAQ uh, on the portal, uh, so regarding the financial liability in lump sum um, grants. Um, but I would say um, uh, this is not on related only to lump sum, so the, the obligation to implement uh, the grant uh, and the, uh, the joint uh, liability uh, is present in any other grant. And uh, we advise to, to already um, deal with this issue in, uh, in your consortium agreement, indeed, uh, so to have some uh, some specific close, uh, clauses uh, uh, on this, um, and uh, yes, the the consortium is jointly responsible for the implementation. Uh, Ulrich, if you would like to yeah, add something, I think. Well, I mean, we're both not lawyers, but I think we should avoid the term joint liability here because I think that's a, that's sort of a very specific term. Uh, that, uh, but what is true, of course, is that uh, consortia are always collectively responsible to deliver, to implement the grant properly and in good quality. And there is no difference between lump sums and actual costs here. So the, there is a, the, the maximum liability in lump sum grants is indeed defined by the lump sum shares. So if a work package is not delivered, the maximum liability of each partner involved in that work package is the share uh, that they have in this work package. But I could also, uh, I, I would stress again, of course, if you do not implement a large share of your actual cost grant, you have exactly the same risk and liability because then that grant is going to be cut if you just simply do not deliver uh, two major work packages or something. So you have the same risk as in, uh, in actual cost grants the, the idea, again, I would like really to refuse uh, to refute the idea that lump sum grants must be properly implemented and only then they are paid, while actual cost grants may as well not be implemented or only partially and still will receive the maximum amount. That is not what is in the model grant agreement and that doesn't describe the risk accurately. Next question. I think we had that as well. Is there any opportunity to negotiate at grant preparation if evaluators have suggested lower unit costs that are reasonable for the beneficiary? I think we've answered that in very exceptional cases. The responsible authorizing officer may deviate from what is the normal approach to not negotiate. But yeah, that would be a case by case exceptional uh, possibility that all can only be decided uh, for an individual project, it's not in line with the normal procedure uh, for our grants. Okay, I think we are already uh, near at the end of the uh, of the time allocated. So uh, um, maybe it's time to wrap up. Or yeah, maybe it's we can have maybe one or two more questions and then uh, wrap up. Okay. Yeah. So uh, next question would be. 
is it possible to cumul cum cumulate a lump sum grant with other public aid for the same eligible costs? If, if yes, how is the funding rate calculated? Mm, so um, this question uh, I think is about on the uh, principle of no double funding and this is uh, checked uh, at, uh, uh, after the proposal has, uh, has been submitted. Um, in case um, the beneficiaries uh, use other, uh, other resources, they should uh, describe this in the proposal. Um, uh, they can do this in the Excel file of the, uh, so in the lump sum detail budget table. Uh, and um, then the, also the, um, the lump sum share that is automatically calculated by the tool will have to be uh, changed in the Part A, so uh, in, um, for the requested grant amount. Maybe I can, we have come in quickly because there is the principle of the balanced budget in all Horizon grants. That means if you have, uh, if you are funded for the same project from another source or if you have, for example, income from the project, then this counts as part of the funding and the total, so you have a total cost, let's say, for a project. Part of that is uh, the funding that you receive from the Commission. Part of that can be uh, other funding that you receive or income that you generate from the project. And the total income that you have, that is the funding received from the EU, funding that you receive from other sources and possible income that you may generate from the project, this together must be equal to the total cost of the project. So in a lump sum case, you first in your uh, budget table, you describe the total cost of that project. You would then inform, for example, in this comment tab that you have uh, other, that you have income or that you have other sources of funding for that project, in which case this amount would then have to be uh, subtracted from the amount calculated by the budget table. Indeed, how this works is also uh, described in the instructions of the budget table. So maybe we still take uh, the last question uh, because that's an, an interesting one and not too difficult to answer. Do the same rules apply to Erasmus Plus projects? Well, yes, as far as Erasmus is using the same model grant agreement, and here I'm not entirely sure if all Erasmus projects always use the corporate lump sum model grant agreement. But in as far as they do, the same rules apply because we have this, uh, the guidance that I mentioned several times now is a corporate guidance. It applies to all lump sum projects, all EU lump sum projects, specifically to the lump sum projects using the Commission's lump sum model grant agreement. So if that is the case, yes, then the very same rules apply. Maybe just one uh, mm -hmm. mention here that uh, um, the, the budget table uh, is different. Uh, so the, the Excel file that we have currently is for Horizon Europe uh, lump sum project. Yeah, that's, that's a good uh, point to add indeed. Uh, while the, the general framework is the same, the rules on, uh, the, rules on uh, the, the budget details needed to establish the lump sum in the first place there can, there, there can be, there are various different models. And also, of course, the dashboard that we use is a specific dashboard for Horizon. There can be other data sets used in other programs. Okay. Right, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope this was useful. You can watch this video um, on our channel and through the Lump Sum webpage on the portal. Later, if you need to, uh, check any particular aspect or any of the previous events. Um, so I hope this was useful. The series will continue. We will be back early 2024 with a follow-up webinar on lump sum funding. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. And thank you also for, uh, to the panelists. Have a nice day.